Katrina. Um, I'm based at the University of York. Um, and I'm based actually between uh, a few different departments. I'm um, technically based in the Department of History, but I also work in the Digital Creativity Labs. I'm on brand today, as you can see. Um, and I'm also based in something called the Audio Lab. My background's in archaeology, hence why I'm here. And um, I'm going to talk about... I think my presentation is going to be quite light touch, as you know, with two papers for... Oh, no, this is going to be fun, isn't it? Two papers from the end of the day, so I thought I'd kind of try and keep it quite light and quite happy. Um, in the session, I'm trying to kind of put myself more towards the end of data reuse and how we can repurpose visual data sets, as I guess my, my, uh, the person who I was following, um, he's already discussing how that's what he wants to, and this is how I actually approach it and how I get that data out of it, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll be good. Uh, I was going to start with this slide, which I use quite a lot actually. And um, it kind of, I use this to say, this is generally how we do a lot of archaeology, it's all very, very visual. This is a whole range of different visualisations or different visual approaches. Um, but actually, obviously, our whole experience of life and experiences in the past are multi-sensory. We don't experience, I mean, how, how many people in the last couple of days have been really frustrated by the architecture of these spaces? As soon as anyone fidgets, you can't hear a thing. As soon as anyone stands up and walks around, you can't hear a thing. Um, oh, God, this is going to be fun, isn't it? Um, so, yeah. I think, I think that it's those kind of levels of experience that I really want to kind of draw in and think about a bit more. Um, and actually, the techniques I'm employing aren't new techniques. They're, they've been around for a, over a century. This is Wallace Sabine. He, he was a professor at Harvard, and he was asked to fix the acoustics of the Hog Art um, Lecture Theatre, I think it is, because they were just so bad. And he developed a whole series of tools um, to explore how acoustics worked based on the sort of space in the building and he developed the relationship and understanding so there's an equation of course there's an equation that links um, the volume of air or space in the room with the scattering properties of the materials that were in those spaces so he spent a lot of time doing that so, and that was in about 1897 1896 something like that so it's not a new technique at all it's just it's been employed in very very different ways i think we had a question before saying buildings are usually designed now to exploit different musical properties and to some extent he was beginning to establish this as an idea um specifically when we talk about uh, buildings like the critical thing i think we need to think about is well we do think about is scattering and absorbing properties of surfaces in the same way we kind of think about visual Things. This is just the different way to think about it. Um, I, these are from ISBR, actually, uh, and that is at the University of Southampton. This is a scattering room and um, the anechoic chamber, which is a dead space, so there's no kind of reverberation. This is fun. Anyway, so we can go into rooms and we can record their acoustical properties, is what I was trying to say. And we can use this kind of setup to do that. So we can excite the room using a sign sweep signal, which goes through all the kind of ranges of things. I mean, I've been discussing this with other people and other people, you can do a very, very simple sound map just by <laughs> clapping and hearing how far the sound goes, or you can pop balloons to do the same thing. You'll notice that this room is quite nice we're talking in, actually. I think you can all hear me at the back. I don't think that's necessarily to do with the microphone. But that's quite good. Um, anyway, so this is how we record the properties of the room. We excite the space using sign sweep, and we record it at a range of positions across the space, and then we can turn that back into an electrical signal to explore uh, digitally. But obviously that records the space as it stands today, and that's not always what we want, especially in archaeology. We often want to kind of peel that back and try and consider it in another way. So we can also model these spaces, as we were discussing, and we were talking about Odeon there. I actually don't use Odeon. I use CAT because that's what ISVR had the licence for and they're very specific about their licences. Um, so I use that, but they both do very, very similar jobs. It's just cats, a bit more delicate, I would say, or a little bit more special to use. So we can also go through this kind of process. And um, I'm not going to touch too much on the kind of under theoretical underpinnings of this, but this is my kind of approach. And I would argue it's a very, very similar approach to how we produce visualisations. <coughs> we don't necessarily go through these exact spe steps, but we often start with surveys of various descriptions, laser scans. I uh, tend to use a total station because I like the interactivity, but we can also use photogrammetry. We start with those di dimensions. Then we can add those furnishings and fittings, the things that have changed from the course of the building. So in the same way as we would build up a reconstruction or a visualisation, we would do the same thing here, fit that room to make it right. 
then I, I always say, does it look right? And I think that's quite an important step because we kind of, that's how we um, calibrate our ideas. Um, we can choose the surface properties at that point, think about what things are reacting, like whether, and this, this is why these spaces are so ridiculous, is that they're all very, um, they're all very scattering surfaces, so they're all reflecting the sound back at you. Whereas uh, if they just put a couple of blankets in, maybe some acoustical soundboards, we might have a better oral experience of this space. Um, then we can add in a choice of an anechoic sound. This is how we produce oralizations. And this is a sound recorded under anechoic conditions, so in a dead space. It means it's kind of a blank canvas noise. And then we can evolve it, which I'll, talk, I'll demonstrate to you in a moment. And then we check it for audibility. And as with all of these projects, um, all these projects, all of these processes, it's, re it's a self-reflective and constantly critiquing cycle. So we can start through that, go back and through that all again. I've already gone on to the next slide, great. Um, I, um, I think it's important to mention, but I'm not going to really consider it in too much depth here, the, excuse me, the red things are very, very visual indicators. I'm using very visual control points here to kind of explore the sound. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a problem, but I think it's something we need to like, think of quite theoretically at some point. Whereas these two points are the only ones where we consider it acoustically. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know if that's a problem, I don't know if we need to be considering this under oral centric conditions as opposed to ocular centric conditions or not, but um, I don't think that's quite relevant to what I want to talk about, I just think it's worth mentioning that we do use such a visual language when we're considering these things. Here's what I think a lot of you will like, we can get some nice quantifiable results out of it, we can get some numbers, do some science, if that seems to be the buzzword of the last couple of days. Um, so we get some uh, various kind of num numerical data out of this, which um, we can then kind of use that to discuss the experience of space and compare it to other experiences of space. Um, now let's listen to something. I'm gonna, I told you there was a step which involved the convolution. This means we can take the room impulse response, or the, like, the sound map of the space, and we can combine that with uh, anechoic sound. Great, I don't know why it's doing that. It's been doing it to lots of people for the last couple of days. There must be a setting that is on here. Um, so to demonstrate what an anechoic sound is. So that's recorded in a dead space, a space where there is no reverberation. So it's like blank canvas of sound. And um, this is when it's been convolved with... So the Houses of Parliament, I think it is. very different and that's like having taken the, those kind of responses into consideration. Now I'm going to put this into a better context. So I'm going to go through a case study and this is the project I'm working on at the moment. This is called Listening to the Commons. This project came out of um, some work undertaken by the University of York called the Virtual St Stephen's Project. It is part of this project that was Anthony Massington who, if you're into 3D modelling, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, produced a whole series of illustrations of the House of Commons in the UK over uh, the course of its extended life. They started with it as a medieval chapel when it was at the heart of the political life of the country. And then it was also adopted as the first, first, sorry, first House of Commons in the uh, 16th century. Um, and then it's become the House of Commons' permanent home until it burnt down in 1834. Um, We've moved on from that and we've, we're, we're con considering, I don't know if you know, it's 100 years since um, women in the UK, or some women in the UK, I should say, got the vote. Um, and we are kind of involved with that. And um, this is because women started to be politically active and engaged with this space quite early on. So, is that going to work? No, it is not. Let's try that. There we go. Um, 
And the whole series of quotes to kind of put this into context. In 1887, women... 1887, no, 1778, wrong date. 1778, women were removed from the House of Commons and were told they were not allowed to return. They used to go and sit in the public galleries and listening to the, listen to the debates that were happening below them, uh, within that space. Around 1818, we start to hear about women who used to go up to a space directly above the House of Commons, to, known as the ventilator. They almost made, created a subversive space where they can listen to the debates that were happening below, despite the fact they'd already banned from being in that space. The project we're going to look at is going to reconstruct this space, so I'm going to get up to the minute. Um, but I think this is quite relevant. I'm going to, these might not seem very relevant to you, but I'm quite angry at the moment. I think a lot of women are quite angry at the moment, we might say. Um, I don't know how many, how many people have been mansplained to in the last two days. Some to me. Um, how many people have been given a statement or anything like that. Anyway, uh, it's also linked because this is also the cellars directly the below where the House of Commons space was, was where Emily Davison was found hiding in the census in 1911 so she could record the House of Commons as her place of residence. And today, this is a quote from one of the MPs in her maiden speech last year. The building, House of Commons, this building is intimidating. It reeks of establishment and of power. Its systems are confusing, some may say archaic, and it was built at a time when my class and my sex would have been denied a place in it because we are deemed unworthy. And that is someone saying that this year. So anyway, Parliament are putting on a rather wonderful exhibition this summer called The Voice in the Vote, and it's exploring the long history of women's suffrage in uh, the UK. And as part of this, we're producing a series of oralisations exploring this ventilator space and women's early experiences of debate in uh, the UK. And this is just one of the first stages of that <coughs> space, and it's considering all these subversive spaces. Um, so to undertake the project, I was given a whole series of visualisations from the original Virtual St Stephen's project, including beautiful images like these, um, uh, a data set, uh, that's a CAD model taken from uh, the 3D models that was kind of based on them. And I was also given a whole series of uh, their original source materials as well. So what they drew on to create their, their, their visual models. Um, and I converted these into an acoustic model. So I asked a question earlier and I said that it's, there's, acoustical software doesn't deal with complex acoustic space words. And that's actually a lie, it just doesn't deal with complex spaces at all. Um, oh, I should point out actually, uh, before I move on, this is the House of Commons, this is a map, um, that might be a laser pointer. Um, so you're looking at, the House of Commons is kind of this bit in the middle of the section, and then the space above the ventilator, you can kind of see poking up, and when we would go and stand around that and put their heads through those holes to look at what's going on and hear what's going on below them. And then the quick below, that's where Emily Davison was found hiding in a cupboard. There's a plaque there, it's a pilgrimage site for many women. Anyway, so I had to convert this model, and that was the process I discussed earlier, that moment of taking room dimensions, and those dimensions were based off this model I was given. Uh, CAT can technically take an entire model from AutoCAD or SketchUp, but it makes it very much, it's very hard then to manipulate that model and figure out how to work with it, and also to then mark it up with different surface properties for each thing. So I was critiqued from, in my abstract that these models are, models are considered too simplistic. They have to be simplistic, and they also take into consideration a lot of different details. So the colours in each of, these, each of these things represent different surface properties. We have glass, we have plaster, we have cushions, we've got people as well. Um, I'm going to give you some moralisations in a minute, and what you've got to remember is the things you're listening to is given in a full space. We've also got to consider who was sitting where and what they were hearing as well. So, made a nice model. Oh, so this one's not got the ventilator on just because it makes it a bit easier to see what's going on within the model, how it's been drawn. Um, anyway, so then we convolved it and we made some very nice sound. This is taken from within the ventilator and it's from a speech given at the um, Dispot batch. A speech made by Henry Beaufoy to the House of Commons, 25th of April, 1792, on the slave trade. Should you have crime of any sort, and in the slave trade, I would show you that crime in the state of tenfold aberration. Give me a decent, a speech yeah. made by Henry. Interesting. Sorry. Let's, let's have one more go at that. A speech made by Henry Beaufoy to the House of Commons, 25th of April, 1792, on the slave trade. Show you have crime of any sort, and in the slave trade, I would show you that crime in the state Give me an instance of guilt, a treasure for the poor, and a slave trade that exhibits instances of that guilt, your investment, your strongly rooted guilt, 
in those two acoustic recordings. Uh, critiques I would normally get are one, that was an empty chamber. No, that was a full chamber. It's just the acoustics are not designed. That space was des originally designed as a medieval chapel and has been adapted for use. So therefore, the acoustics are not particularly well designed for public speaking. Um, we also, we do have a lot of nice background noise to work in. So actually, there's quite a lot of evidence of members using the building to disrupt what was going on within the Commons Chamber, making it too difficult for people to give a speech so they couldn't understand what was going on as well. Um, and those are going to be incorporated into later um, oralisations we produce for the gallery, but we can't discuss them very much at the moment because Houses of Parliament are being a bit difficult. Shocking that. Uh, anyway, um, but I, I, like, I hope this demonstrates how we can repurpose visual data sets for getting other data out of them. Um, there are quantifiable results as well, and I don't. I haven't talked about them very much because I'm not sure whether how much we should be consuming visual data, uh, consuming oral data visually, and how helpful that necessarily is sometimes. Um, and that's partly me being stuck in a bit of a theoretical bind about what I think about that. But those that data will get used, and that will get published soon. So thank you. I hope that was interesting. Thank you. 